Welcome to Profiles and in Leadership interview series, sponsored by VGM Advantage. I'm Steve Anderson, your host, and today our guest is Jerry Belour. Jerry Belour grew up in Renton, Washington, and married his high school sweetheart, and they have three wonderful children, Brianne, Benjamin, Jacqueline, and one grandchild, Blakely. Jerry is a 1976 graduate of the University of Washington and a 1979 graduate of UPS School of Law, now called Seattle U, which purchased UPS Law School. He formed a law firm six months after passing the bar, Cromwell, Mendoza, and Ballure, a small firm which did a lot of people law. They were partners for 18 years, during which time he also served as municipal court judge for the city of Tukwila, 12 years on the bench. In 1999, he purchased an interest in and became president and CEO of EPK and Associates, a benefits administrative firm, a niche market. He retired in 2017 and is just beginning to write the next chapter in his life. So welcome, Jerry. Appreciate you being here today. Thanks, Steve. Good to be here. Now, what is not in this bio is anything about your athletic accomplishments. Now, let's talk about 1971 because uh, you had a real claim to fame that's pretty impressive. And so what I hear, you can run pretty fast. Well, uh, thanks, Steve. I, I actually, I could run pretty fast. Uh, uh, I was given a gift of, of speed. Uh, uh, there's something about, about speed in an athlete. Uh, either you have it or you don't. Uh, if you have it, it can be, uh, it can be uh, 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 perfected and, and worked on. But if you don't have it, it's tough to make yourself faster exactly. if you don't have the speed. Yeah. Uh, but I was lucky enough to uh, be a state champion hurdler as a junior in high school in 1970. Then in 1971, I uh, ran the fastest time in the, uh, in the country uh, in the event that I was uh, competing in, which at that time was the 180 low hurdles. And uh, uh, just to give you some insight as to how old I am, that event does not exist anymore. Um, that must have been pretty heady. To, I mean, the, the best time in the nation as a high school senior. That's, that's it, was, uh, it was quite a thrill, let's put it that way. I can, I can still see myself on the track when the, uh, the uh, uh, finish line uh, judge told me what my time was, and I, uh, I jumped pretty high. I, I was really excited. Uh, but I, there was also a life lesson in that, uh, in that accomplishment. The week after that, which is our state championship meet here in the, uh, in the state of Washington, and, the, and in the very first event, uh, I also ran the high hurdles, and I hit a high hurdle, uh, the second hurdle from the end, and, and broke my foot, and I was done competing uh, in that state championship, uh, wow. which, was, uh, which was very difficult, as you can imagine, for a 17-year-old yeah. high school senior. Uh, 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 my teammates were counting on me for a lot. Uh, I was counting on myself for a lot, but it, it just didn't happen. But it, it taught me a life lesson that, uh, uh, that carried through uh, throughout my professional life, my work life, uh, my family life. Uh, uh, that uh, that still holds me in pretty good stead today. Yeah, and it didn't end there because then you went on to the University of Washington and ran in a four by four hundred relay team that uh, actually did extremely well in the NCAA championship. I Is did, I did, and that's the great thing about about sports uh, uh, that opportunity for uh, uh, for achieving something after you you perhaps failed uh, through no no consequence of yourself, whether it was an injury or something like that, and. Yeah, I was, I was fortunate enough to be uh, a member of a 1975 mile relay championship team. We won the uh, uh, mile relay in Provo, Utah that year for the Huskies. We were, uh, 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 it was quite a shock that actually we won uh, a team from the north, uh, the northern part of the country. Hadn't really won uh, a four by four uh, mm -hmm. event for a long time. And I, I had three wonderful teammates uh, uh, who, uh, um, who were just really for, uh, important in my formative years. and. Uh, we had the fastest time in the uh, world that year for a college team, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, quite, uh, quite an accomplishment. That's amazing. For us. To tell, tell us a little bit about that bond that you had with those teammates. I mean, from what I understand, you came from very different backgrounds, you had very different upbringings, but yet as a group, uh, from what I hear, uh, there's a really tight bond, and you guys are still uh, tight today. We are, uh, uh, and, we, and we have been since that time. As much as you can after everyone kind of goes and starts their life after college. Uh, uh, I was, uh, uh, I had three black uh, teammates that were members uh, of the mile relay. Uh, the guys uh, uh, used to take a bit of ribbing from the other teams because uh, they used to look at me and I always had this kind of uh, 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 issue I had to deal with. I was a 
small white guy who was sprinting uh, with a lot of uh, 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 bigger, uh, uh, different type of athletes. Uh, yeah. But the beauty of the, of the sport that I was in was it really didn't matter. We all lined up at the start line. Uh, the gun went off and it was whoever crossed the finish line first uh, was the winner. So, so I really appreciated being part of a sport that had an objective measurement, who crossed the line first, but I also really uh, enjoyed and, and uh, um, um, actually thrived in the team a part of being a part of a relay team. Uh, yeah. uh, we were all concerned about our individual performances, but we were a unit, and uh, it was really a special time. Yeah, that's great. And then, uh, you know, with the events of today, it's it's nice to athletics sometimes uh, gets rid of that race barrier a little bit, and it didn't matter as long as you performed, as long as you you did well. Uh, everyone was uh, equal. It, it did not, and it gave me a, a, a greater understanding of some of the issues mm -hmm. again that we're talking about today that that my teammates faced uh, uh, growing up and, and uh, you know, going through college. So it was, yeah. uh, it was an interesting time in the 70s. There was a lot going on. That's great. So what do you think you learned as a world-class track athlete that, that helped you as an attorney and then as a business owner? Well, I learned the importance of, of setting goals. Um, I think that's a very basic uh, uh, um, attribute that you, uh, you should have in life and you can, it can be expressed uh, uh, um, in, in very many different ways, but setting goals and then uh, hitting certain milestones along the way, but also understanding that during your journey towards uh, uh, hopefully achieving your goals, there are gonna be setbacks. And uh, it's really how you overcome and react to those setbacks, whether it be in athletics, whether it be as an attorney, whether it be in a business sit a setting, that really kind of defines uh, uh, who you are and uh, 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 how you want to uh, kind of portray yourself to, to, to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great lesson. I got to ask you this. Mm -hmm. Were you cocky or just a little naive when you started a law firm six months past the bar exam? Well, I was a little bit of both. <laughs> okay. I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I will, I'll be honest with you. It, it was interesting the way it came about. I had, I had interned uh, at, a, at a law firm. Uh, while I was in law school. Uh, I was working uh, for 20 hours a week while I was still in law school, which really gave me some uh, real life experience in the law firm that I, that I was interning with. But then one, and then they offered me a job and, and gave me a job right out of law school. But I observed some things in my first few months of practice that uh, for me didn't sit well ethically. I just didn't think that uh, some of the things around me were, were being done in an ethical, proper way. And that's not, the way that I wanted to run my professional life. And so uh, I got together with a, actually a couple of partners in that firm and we had some conversations and we split off. And yeah. uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a great decision. Well, that, that took a lot of guts at that stage of your career to <laughs> question people that have been doing it for a long time and, and standards set and this is the way it's always done. I mean, we've all heard that in the business world. So uh, it, it take, you, you were brave. To, it, to it's hard, you know, it's hard to do the right thing uh, yeah. because mm -hmm. Uh, um, obviously more often than, than not, the right thing might require you to give up something or, or uh, uh, avoid a shortcut uh, 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 down a path that you might not want to go down. So, uh, you know, maybe courageous or, or whatever is, is one way to put it, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a bedrock of my, uh, my uh, ethical framework both in my professional and my business life yeah, uh, from yeah. the beginning. And, and you were rewarded for doing the right thing, which helps, right? It does, so, it does. So what did you learn from those early years that, uh, that a more experienced, wiser man as you are now um, uh, knew later? I mean, what, what, what do you know now that you didn't know then? That, uh, well, I knew that it was okay to, to feel uh, um, uncertain about how you were gonna perform in a setting, whether it be in a courtroom, whether it be uh, uh, working with a client, whether it uh, uh, be trying to work your best for uh, the best possible outcome for your client, um, that it was okay to have feelings of uncertainty about how you were gonna perform, mm -hmm. but it was also important to jump into the arena. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one thing I learned about, it, 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 you know, going back to my athletic experience, it, it was always important for me to be involved in the it, whether it was the athletic contest or the, uh, the resolving of a dispute between individuals or it was representing an individual had been wronged, you need to be in the arena in order to 
uh, affect an outcome. Now that doesn't mean you're always gonna be successful, right. but you have to be, I've always felt you have to be in there, you kinda have to uh, walk the walk if you're gonna talk to Yeah, them. yeah. And then also uh, uh, hard work, I would assume too. Again, going back to your, uh, your uh, four by four uh, relay mm -hmm. uh, uh, days at the University of Washington, I heard you worked harder than anybody else. In fact, I even heard stories that maybe you uh, uh, would force yourself to physical sickness sometimes in training for that event. So hard work and, and then just uh, backing that up with doing the right thing. Or no question it? about it. Any, yeah. any success that you attain, there is going to be hard work behind the scenes. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just uh, you know, in the days of, uh, current days of these, you know, you read about all these startups and people you know, finding something and then turning it into, into something. Uh, my guess is that before that happened, there was a lot of hard work that went into it behind yeah. the scenes. It just doesn't, uh, success yeah. doesn't come without um, the, uh, the sweat and the blood. Yeah, I would agree. So going on to when you became a judge, I can only imagine what the weight of being a judge must be like. I, do you worry about the direct impact you had on people's lives when you make a decision? That's got to be a heavy burden to... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah there, was, there was no question about it. it, it what I found out about myself uh, uh, when I was a judge was that in many ways my, uh, uh, my, my makeup and my, my uh, uh, goals, my uh, uh, values were, were more suited uh, uh, to being a judge uh, than perhaps it was being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. A lawyer, you're, you're an advocate. You're, you're, you work as hard as you can to give your client that you're representing the best possible representation that you can under the law. Right. Uh, uh, that may mean that you might take positions that in a, in a public sense, people are saying, why is he doing this? Or yeah, what? Yeah. But, but you have to do that. In a judge, when, when you're sitting as a judge, you are given a certain responsibility. There is the law. The law is the law. The judges don't write the law. They're there to basically interpret the law given a certain factual situation. Mm -hmm. But every time I had to make a decision, there was a human being that was going to be the recipient <clears throat> of whatever decision I made. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, took, I, I took that very seriously. Um, uh, I worked in a municipal court, which was for a city, so the offenses that we were seeing were not what you would call major offenses, yeah. but they had real life impacts right. on people. I could send people to jail for a year. I could impose significant fines on them. I could restrict their ability to, um, to uh, drive and things like, just practical day-to-day -day things. Right. But I always felt that it was critical for my ability to um, have my sentences or my, my decisions um, received in, in the way that I wanted by these people to always feel that the people in front of me were given a fair hearing. Yeah. It was hard to do. We had long calendars. I mean, I, uh, I used to come home a couple nights, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night to my family. And the first thing I'd do is I'd, I'd give everyone a big hug and say, guys, we got it great. There's a lot of, a lot of people out there that are in yeah. difficult yeah. situations that have, you know, come from difficult backgrounds or find themselves in situations they probably didn't try to be in. Um, but they always had a fair hearing in front of me. I always listened to their position. Um, and uh, throughout time, I think uh, uh, I earned a certain uh, level of respect, not only from the people that were before me, but were from the prosecutors, defense lawyers, uh, all of those that appeared in my courtroom. And not to ask for specifics, mm -hmm. but we're, has uh, is, is one ever haunted you? Have you ever been unable to shake one? or? Or did you just? Uh, uh, no, okay. no. I, I really, I really was. I, I kind of the opposite of that. There were a couple people I bumped into after I was on the bench, years after I was gone, and and uh, they had appeared before me. And and uh, one gentleman I'll never forget. He was a person that actually I sent uh, 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 to jail for the longest time. And he came up to me. I was watching a high school basketball game, and he came mm -hmm. up to me, and uh, he he said to me, he says, Judge Ballour, because I. You know, it had been a number of years. I said, yeah. yes. That's, and, and then I recognized this gentleman. And yeah. he said, you know, you, you changed my life. I said, really? I said, yeah, if you hadn't done what you'd done to me, I probably wouldn't be here. And I certainly would have taken a different path in my life. So for all of the tough cases, the situations didn't work, just to get one or two of those, it really yeah. it made yeah. it worth it. That, that's, that's powerful. 
You know, being from now both sides of the fence in, in the law world, uh, attorney and, and then on, this, on the bench, do you feel our legal system is, uh, is fair and still works for most people, or do you have concerns? Well, that's a, that's a tough question, Steve. I, I, uh, uh, let's put it this way. I think it's, it's the best system that uh, I'm aware of that exists uh, uh, on an international scale. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question honestly, no, I don't think it works for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it just doesn't. Um, uh, uh, I just finished reading a book uh, by Brian Stevenson uh, called Just Mercy, uh, and he started the Equal Justice Initiative uh, years ago. Uh, um, uh, dealing with uh, the people who were on death row that were, were wrongly uh, 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 convicted. Uh, they were pushed through a system that um, quite honestly was, uh, did not treat them fairly. Right, right. And, and just reading some of those stories up until the present time, you can see that they're, the system is, is, is somewhat overwhelmed. Uh, the resources aren't there. Uh, the courts are dealing with issues that are way beyond just legal issues. They're dealing with uh, issues involving mental health, uh, involving public uh, uh, safe, uh, public uh, health issues in terms of substance abuse and things like that. So uh, it's working the best in terms of systems, I believe, but yeah. there, are, there are holes and there are gaps. Right. Well, nothing's perfect, that's and for sure. No so, kidding. Yeah. So you, you said it a little bit, what I heard you say about sitting on the bench as a judge, uh, that you, know, you had to really listen and listening was an important part of it. But, uh, what, what else did you learn from that time on the bench that, uh, that, that you feel um, you, that you use later to bring value to employees that you work with and so on? Always treat people with respect. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that may sound like a cliche, but that really carried over into my, into my work life when I, when I became a, 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 a head of a company. Everyone brings a certain uh, um, background, a certain set of circumstances to whatever situation they find themselves in. And I've always felt it was really important to treat people with respect. You, if you start from there, then the direction that, that they take you will either go a positive way, it might go a negative way. I, have, I haven't encountered that very much. Mm -hmm. Most likely to go a positive way with a beginning of, I respect you. I know you're in a difficult position. You probably have some issues we have to deal with, but let's start from the fact that I do respect you as a person, and yeah. let's work work on. Yeah, that. and I think you know most people in the world just want to be heard. They want to be understood and, and and acknowledged for for things. And I think if uh, I think that's what you're saying, and, and giving them respect and treating them that way, um, you know, usually better things happen than ignoring them or coming to them with a preconceived idea of what, what's oh, going on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, no question yeah. about it. You know, I feel that anyone who runs a business that provides their employees with, uh, with health benefit plans needs to understand that they are in the business of health care, whether they admit it or not, right? So do you feel that companies' employees are, are active enough in, in, in dealing with their health benefits and, and trying to control those costs? or? Are they just relying too much on, on third-party payers to do it? What's your feeling on that and in, in your experience as running uh, uh, your, your benefits administration firm? Well, it, uh, to, to kind of break your, your question up into pieces, uh, there's no question that employees need to become more involved in understanding how the healthcare delivery system works mm -hmm. and how they can make it work best for them, not only from a how do I keep myself healthy uh, position, but what is uh, uh, the best way to approach it from a financial uh, aspect? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the way that our system has, has evolved from the late 40s until now, basically an employer-based uh, 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 system that provides these benefits uh, uh, to their employees for, you know, the, the tax code has, has uh, uh, pushed every, everything that way. Uh, um, our uh, uh, private enterprise system has also been involved in this, mm -hmm. in this, in this issue. But uh, I think what we're seeing now is that the system is, is, is broken. Mm -hmm. And we're all, as a society, trying to come up with ways, how can we fix it? How can we 
address it, understanding that the fix is going to have to be a long-term solution. That's really hard for all of us that are sitting like we are today, right. uh, because what we may see as a fix for us today may not be what really we need to do as a society or as, a, uh, a, as an employer uh, that's best for moving our system uh, forward so that it better serves not only the people that are involved in the system that are providing the health care, but yeah. those that are receiving it. So I jumped ahead a little bit, so let's jump mm -hmm. back a sure. little bit. So explain to, uh, to the viewers what, what you did in, in your company and, and what your goal was uh, as, a, as, a, as a firm okay. dealing sure. with that. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, I was fortunate, to, uh, uh, fortunate enough to know the business that I purchased and became involved in before I, di before I actually did that, in the okay. sense that I was their legal counsel. Okay. So I had seen them grow and, and uh, uh, evolve through, uh, through time. So I knew a little bit about their business, from basically from the legal uh, okay. uh, uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we, I, I think we, we acknowledge that the system, I hate to use the term broken, it was fractured. It was just, yeah. it wasn't working uh, as smoothly as, as it should. But we, uh, 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 my partner uh, uh, and I, we, we, we developed a, a system within this imperfect or fractured system where we could benefit an employer by helping reduce the actual cost to the employer, mm -hmm. to the employee who uh, would have a, an entity, my company, that would help them navigate through the system. Right. And we were able to uh, uh, innovate in the sense that we controlled the pool of individuals. We, what we did is we pooled small companies, a company with five, 10, 15, 20 employees into a large purchasing group. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to uh, design and provide them benefits that you would only be able to get or, or use uh, uh, from a big employer. Right. Um, so, so we could. We also knew our, our population. Uh, we had a specific type of population that, that we felt would benefit from our uh, from our. Uh, I hate to call it our little mouse trap that we developed. Right. It was a, it was a different a different uh, a thought process, uh, and then we uh, we innovated and we uh, we did things a little differently. We we gave our employers and their employees kind of white glove service. We relieved a lot of the uncertainty that employers face dealing with all these regulations and yeah. statutes and things like that. We took that off their plate. We said, look, you just we have points of contact here. We'll, if you have a question or your employees have an issue, we'll help you get through it. Yeah. Um, and we were also able to do things that, uh, you know, uh, the Affordable Care Act in, in 2010 came in with some things like preventive care, no cost preventive care, in other mm -hmm. words, have an annual physical, uh, all of these tests at no cost to, to you as an employee. Mm -hmm. Why would we do that? Well, first of all, it's good for the employee to kind right. of know right. what, what's going on. It also keeps our pool of people healthy. We did that 10 years before the ACA uh -huh. came out with that as this great innovation, free right. preventive right. care. And, and uh, so along the way, we, we benefited uh, the employers, the employees, and uh, when there's a lot of wins along the way, guess what? Yeah. It's usually a good outcome. Yeah, and so I think the lesson that we're hearing that you just described though is that if you're a smaller company, you need to pool together, you need to collaborate, you need to be part of something bigger to have the leveraging and bargaining power that the big companies already have. If so it's possible, yeah. but, but the, the framework throughout our country, we've got 50 states with 50 different sets of laws. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not as easy as it, as it seems, uh, but we also found out that we were good at something, mm -hmm. and we said, you know what? Let's just be good at what mm -hmm. we do. Yeah. Let's not try to be something that we're not, or do something more than we are equipped to do. Um, we tried that a couple times, and, yeah. and that's all, all businesses do that. You right. know, you you don't become successful unless you have failures along the way. Exactly. And and so we mm -hmm. we learned that, and we said, you know, this is okay. Let's let's work this and and. Yeah. Uh, it turned out to be a good decision. So not to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. because I don't know if anyone has the answer right now of how to fix this healthcare broken system, but uh, what's one thing that you think that we sh could do that would make a difference to bring 
access to more people and lower the cost. Is there anything, in your opinion, that we as a nation or we as a society should really try and do? Oh, any one thing. Um, there isn't any one thing. I, I, I don't want to be a, a, a down, a, you know, create a downer about that. But there's really, there's not really one. There's not a silver yeah. bullet out there. It, it, it's it's going to take a, a, a really a, a difficult, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. but honest discussion uh, amongst the stakeholders, whether it be uh, doctors, hospitals, uh, insurance carriers, pharmaceuticals companies. These are all intertwined. You know, yeah. you're talking about what is it? They say one sixth of our economy is somehow intertwined with healthcare. That's, right. that's a, it's a big, it's a, it's a big, big it's yeah, a big, big it's a big item with a lot of people, right. with a lot of different people that are, that are doing things there mostly for the right reasons. You know, yeah. whether it's physical therapists or yeah. it's uh, physicians or it's nurse practitioners, uh, all the people along the way. These are professionals who have carved out a career or a desire to work a certain way, but. It's very complicated. So I guess yeah. to answer your question, I don't have. Yeah, well, really that, it's, it's a tough question because I know that, you know, one of the, you know, you talk to a lot of CEOs and, and I think in the past, CEOs of companies have often said, well, you know, healthcare is kind of, you know, that's complicated. We don't really understand it. So we just have, you know, our broker do that and, and that's what we do. But, but I guess I'm of the opinion now that I think as CEOs of companies, you have to address it like it's part of your, your company itself. And you have to know what you want, demand what you want, uh, push the broker and the firms in different mm -hmm. ways, and, and become much more hands-on active in your approach to health benefits right. to, to really make a difference, at least for your company. Yeah, and there are little things that you can do as, yeah. as a head of a company right. that can have a big effect on yeah. not only the cost uh, factor of, of all of this, but also the health, health and wellness of your employees. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I've always believed, and, and again, it sounds cliches, but your employees are your most important asset. Absolutely. And, yeah. and when you understand that, um, all of your future success uh, that flows uh, you know, from your business will result from that basic premise that your employees are your most important asset. Yeah, absolutely. So you're not a, you're not a single, uh, single payer guy, or you're not uh, one of these that thinks you know, after going through that, that there has to be some dramatic change like that? I, I think what I hear you're saying is there's just going to have to be maybe compromises and and steps in a, you know along right. the way that it's going to take time. Yeah, incremental yeah. changes I think are the key. Yeah. I hear I hear the word single payer. I never hear what that means to the yeah. person that's speaking single payer. What does yeah. that really mean? And and as we know, it's the devil's always in the details. Exactly. Um, but I will tell you, I don't think that health insurance and health care should be a responsibility of an employer. That's the way our system has, has evolved. Right. But I don't think that that's, it, it doesn't make sense. If you, if you step back and look at it, it, it makes us as a country and our businesses less competitive mm -hmm. if we have to make sure we're taking care of our employees' health care needs right. when it may not be related to whatever business or right. professional outcomes we're, we're, we're seeking. Now, how we, how we move from the situation we're into a situation where there's less involvement or perhaps someday no involvement from the employer is, is a process that's gonna take a generation. Right, right. And, and so, and will quote single payer, whatever that means and whatever that looks like, be part of the solution? Yes, it may in fact be. It may be that there is a level of coverage that is basic, that is provided but there may be ways to build on that that is a choice of the individual person or perhaps an individual company. So there's all kinds of kind of uh, 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 nuances that can be placed on the current system um, that can move us forward to, yeah. to solving it. Okay, great. So uh, now you retired in uh, January of this year, so uh, how's the retirement going so far? Are you you know, it's it's going it's going fine. Uh, uh, I'm still a, 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 an owner of the piece of my company, so I want to see that succeed. So, you know, I pop in. I'm I'm kind of the number one cheerleader over there. I I, I it's hard to, to, to work close with people uh, for 18 years, uh, and then and just walk away. Yeah. And, and so, how if I were to say, how would you you describe your leadership style? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Uh, my leadership style was. Uh, one where I 
gave a lot of responsibility to my employees. Mm -hmm. I, I recognized uh, the things that we had to do to be successful, but I, I didn't have the skill set that was necessary to uh, accomplish, um, yeah. accomplish that. So my, my leadership style was, it's okay to hire people that are smarter than me. Yeah. I, 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 I've never had a, a big ego or anything like that. It's always, mm -hmm. okay, you know how to do this, and this is what we need, a, a piece of what we need to do to make our company successful. You got it, run with it. Yeah. And what I found is that if you give people uh, uh, responsibility, freedom, freedom to not only uh, thrive, but also to make mistakes, yeah. uh, that uh, you're going to have employees that are engaged, um, that are working towards uh, a, a unified goal for the company. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I guess it was a bit of a hands-off leadership yeah. uh, style. Um, uh, uh, I wasn't a micromanager. Yeah. Uh, uh, I strongly believe in delegating. Uh, I, uh, I, I never, I don't want to say never, it was never part of my makeup to, to blame people mm -hmm. if things didn't go the way that you hoped they went or you, that you right. thought they should go. Uh, that doesn't mean that we didn't analyze mistakes we made. We sure. always did, but we tried to learn from that. Right. Um, well, it goes back to what you said before is that a culture that is okay with failure to a certain extent because that's how we learn and that's how we grow. And then building from there is, is, a, is an organization that, that gets better and better. Right. Yeah. And, and th what we were doing, uh, we, had, we had some pretty heavy responsibilities if you think about it. When people are sick or they're injured, they don't want to have to worry about, is my insurance going to work? Yeah. So we had to make sure that when people were enrolled uh, and when people got their benefits, that they were available to them so that when they went to the pharmacy they knew that it was they could pick up their prescription without a problem or if their child was injured and they went to the emergency room that it was not going to be an issue so we had certain core responsibilities that we had to do yeah. and we did them well but once we kind of nailed that then there was freedom to okay well how can sure. we maybe make it a little better maybe yeah. we look at this kind of thing yeah and i think it's a great point you make is that as leaders as heads of companies you know, it's okay to admit you don't know everything and that you hire people that are really good in that area yeah. and you become more of, a, of a, 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 a facilitator or an organizer of those great people as opposed to you having to know all the answers. Exactly. And a part of that was transparency. I was yeah. always transparent with my, with my employees about what was going on in terms of, you know, why are we doing this? Well, this is our goal. This is what we hope. You may not see it right now, but this is yeah. where we're going. Yeah. Or if there was a, a, a legislative issue or a regulatory issue, we're, we're in a heavily mm -hmm. regulated business. I always made sure that they understood so that they didn't, you know, pick up the paper one day and read this and come to work and say, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. So, and, I, and, and in the end, that really proved to be a, a, a great benefit to us as a company because we, we had to go through some battles. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I always believe that the more that they knew about what we were doing and why we were doing it, then they would understand the outcome, even if it wasn't as, as we had hoped the outcome was. Yeah. But more often than not, it was. Yeah, yeah great point. So we like to leave our uh, listeners with a pearl of wisdom So uh, in relation to leadership. So if you're going to leave us today with a pearl of wisdom uh, relating to leadership, what would you say? Uh, understand that the people that work with you uh, are there uh, for, for many reasons and that they have a, a life outside of work. Yeah. Um, you know, the, one, of the, one of the issues in, in, in today is the work-life balance and, and things like that. Um, I, I chose a, a specific path in my work career. Uh, early on, I knew that I didn't want to be part of a large organization where uh, my individuality or my contribution was perhaps not felt as much as I would hoped it would be. So mm -hmm. I chose to, to work in a smaller environment, closer with my employees. And that gave me great satisfaction because 
I always, you know, when people came to work for me, I said, okay, here's the important things. Family's number one, and, you know, work is, is number two. It's somewhere below that. Yeah. But I had to live that, and I had to make sure that my employees also were able to live that. So uh, understand that when they're there working for you, the people that are, that are um, thinking, innovating, creating, uh, just coming in and grinding, they have a life outside of work. And if you acknowledge that, and you're flexible with that, when you can be, then you're going to get back from them uh, tenfold whatever you gave up for, yeah, for yeah. allowing them to, to have that balance. And yeah. I, it's worked out well for me. Yeah, great, great. Well, Jerry, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciated uh, talking with you. Uh, uh, I think we heard a lot of great things and uh, um, just want to thank you for your time. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Steve. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. And uh, this is a, a go ahead and go to our website, uh, VGM Advantage, and look under um, uh, video interviewing, and you can see all of our series and profiles in leadership. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.